Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the great presentation. I don't know, I don't know if I deserve it actually, but but nevertheless, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, I, I, what I will be telling you about, I will be telling you about, you know, uh, basically the, the the research that I did uh, uh, in the last five years in the context of, of the advanced C uh, uh, that I managed to get to win in uh, in. Uh, uh, in 2014, and the, 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 the grant is now has been is, is finished. And now I'm starting another one, and that will last for an additional five years. So I hope that in the next I can be able to tell you a little bit more about this story uh, uh, if you are kind enough to invite me again. So what what the, uh, I'm talking about? We talking before telling you what I'm talking about. I just would like to in, to show a few people that have been uh, uh, working on the project. I, otherwise, I always forget, you know, to, to recognize the, uh, these people that really did the, they really did the job. And uh, I, again, I would like to mention particularly uh, Laura uh, and uh, Alberto, as you can probably understand from, this, uh, from the family name, this is my son. He's crazy. He's crazy. He's crazy. He's crazy, he's crazy enough to you know to decide to work it, to work to work with me. Actually, we are enjoying you know doing science together. It's really, it's really a pleasure. And he's, he's working particularly on the on the immunotherapy part. Okay. And uh, these people are working most on the bacterial uh, infection disease uh, 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 part. And I would like also to acknowledge the contribution of Ilaria and Enrico. Uh, uh, I will tell you, uh, uh, because we are using CRISPR-Cas technology, uh, and uh, I, I, I will not get absolute into the detail, but I just will tell you why we, are, we have been using CRISPR-Cas technology. And these uh, uh, two persons, particularly Laria, uh, I will show that she did a tremendous amount of work, you know, to create this new strain, you know, which, uh, has, which carry a number of mutations, or mutation that is now we are using for, for, the, for the application that we're interested in, in, in vaccine, developing vaccine for infectious disease and cancer. So I really would like to thank these people. There are other people, but these are partially uh, the, the, the major players of, of, the, of this. So uh, outer member vesicle, but think about the member vesicle. I don't know how many of you are familiar with these uh, funny uh, structures. But let me just tell you what uh, the outer member, for those of you that maybe are, even, are not extremely familiar with that, let me just introduce what it's about. Old gram-negative bacteria, old gram-negative bacteria, I'm not aware of any uh, gram-negative here that it does not. Old gram-negative bacteria release this uh, vesicle. And this vesicle are released by virtue of the fact that the outer member in the, <coughs> the gram-negative bacteria basically budding up. And, uh, and by doing so, this, you know, this, uh, this bacteria uh, release a portion of the membrane, you see, and uh, what, is, uh, what this membrane is about, this outer member vesicle is about this outer membrane, carrying you know, all protein and component of the outer membrane, and eventually protein which are localized in the periplasmic space. You know that in the negative there is an inner in in membrane, Periplasmic is very out the membrane. So the, this, the vesicle is, that's it, that's it. It's, uh, it's not living, obviously, organism, uh, just portion of the membrane in which entrapped also uh, components of the periplasmic space. What is about? So now, when this vesicle has been discovered, actually, if you go back, uh, uh, the, the first paper that I'm aware of that really uh, uh, demonstrated the existence of this, uh, of this vesicle is uh, from the UK. And in, this is an E. coli, and they 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 so they, they realized that the LPS, the lipopolysaccharide, is uh, somehow released in the supernatant of this culture. And eventually, they by looking by looking by doing little microscopy analysis, they they realized that this uh, the, L, the LPS, which obviously decorated the outer membrane, is in the in the supernatant mostly because uh, there are these outer member vesicles which are released. Okay, so that is the one. And uh, in, probably about, this, about the same time, we are going in the 60s, uh, in Calcutta, uh, a group of, of scientists was, were, uh, 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 was working on, on, uh, on, uh, vi uh, on the Vibio cholera. Okay, and because they found that the cholera toxin is also released in, uh, in, uh, in the supernatant. And again, at the end of the day, they realized that this is, uh, this, the, the, the toxin isn't the supernatant because it's, it's uh, entrapped into this vesicle, 
okay? And actually, this is a very interesting thing because the way Vibrio deliver the toxin to the host, when in fact the host is through uh, outer <coughs> vesicle. This is one of the mechanisms, the major mechanism how the toxin is, uh, is, uh, is distributed in the, in the, in the, into, into, the, into, into the, the host, uh, into the body of the host. Uh, but you know, that was a kind of curiosity, and actually thanks to the, these two groups uh, uh, from the, in, um, f uh, that uh, the, um, directed by <laughs> Uh, Dr. Beveridge and Cohen, that basically the, 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 the outer member vaccine became, became more and more popular. And now, you know, there are a large number, and if, if, if the large probably is too much, but in several groups that are working on, on the outer member vesicle. And the main reason for that is not only to study the biology, which is fascinating for in microbiology as a, as, a, as a background, is a really fascinating story, but I will not tell you anything about that. I just would like to show one couple of curiosities. But the outer member vesicle are more and more studies because of the applications, because they try to, we hope that we'll be able to convince you that they are particles that can be used uh, uh, for a number of biotechnological applications, particularly for vaccine application. Okay, and I will try to convince you why this is so. Just two slides of the two curiosity about the function, the biological function, you know, uh, of, uh, of um, of the vesicle. This is a beautiful uh, uh, study uh, 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 in which they show that basically the uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Shigella basically exchange material. They exchange the, uh, in particular, they exchange the outer membrane. In, uh, in, <clears throat> in this slide, it shows that uh, the outer member vesicle from, from, uh, from uh, Shigella basically can bind the surf to the surface of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Pseudomonas and they literally integrate it, they integrate into the membrane. So basically now you have a, a, a hybrid outer member vesicle constituted by the Pseudomonas and Chigella. And so it's, it, this is a fascinating mechanism in which you know, bacteria exchange directly materials, not through a genetic uh, a modification, but, sim by, by, but by simply, you know, exchange a portion of the vest or the membrane. And so they exchange, you know, the function. That is a fascinating. Another thing that I uh, don't want to bother you too much, you know, but org I said organ negative bacteria produce also bacteria from, from the Antarctic uh, uh, area, you know, and they, they vesiculate like crazy. And this is funny because it is pretty cold down there. Oh, up there, down, down, down there, yeah, and, uh, and uh, you think that they try to keep everything on, but this is not the case. They keep circulating like crazy. And this is a fascinating story because this is uh, Delphia is a gram-negative bacterium <coughs> which live in the environment and basically uh, utilize hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon as, as a carbon, primary carbon source. Okay, in the environment, it can be dry, it can be wet, whatever, when it's dry, obviously is for this bacteria it's difficult to get the nutrients. Okay, so how they do that? They basically uh, in, incorporate enzymes which degrade hydrocarbon in the vesicle, and the way to uh, get access to the nutrient is to propel the vesicle a, a long distance, and, use, and they use the, this, uh, this uh, funny structure, which is they, they call polyplot, and that you see, these are long, long filament structure, which basically are used to launch, you know, to propel, you know, the vesicle out. So, this is one one way that uh, can be used. But anyway, I don't want to bother you too much with the mech, with the biology, but it's a fascinating, fascinating area. But let me go. Uh, I've been, I've, I've worked for 40 years in industry, so I, I, I cannot. Uh, I, I have to. I'm mostly talking about application and problem. Sorry about that. Uh, not too much about science, uh, uh, but let me tell, let me introduce the, the, the why uh, vesicles are so interested, you know, from a biotechnological application and vaccine application. Uh, for uh, for vaccine application, for three main reasons, <clears throat> which make them a theoretically beautiful uh, a beautiful platform for vaccine. The first reason is that these vesicles have what, what we say. In, 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 in vaccinology and in, in, in immunology, they have a built-in adjuvanticity. They are potent stimulators of the immune system. And the reason for that is because the, the, the all uh, bacteria of outer men, all, uh, the, outer, but the, the, the surface of the bacteria contain carry a lot, many components that stimulate innate immunity. 
LPS is one, and LIPO protein is another, there are, and I will introduce a few of them. So, uh, and therefore, these vesicles, as soon as they get into the host, they activate the innate immunity, and therefore, it is a cascade, you can get the activation of uh, that active immunity. So, a fantastic adjuvant, okay? That is one reason. The second reason, and I will convince you that this is the case, you can manipulate them. In other words, you can take, you can take the bacterium which produce the OMVs, you can engineer the bacterium in such a way that you force the bacterium to deliver, to deliver heterologous antigens into the vesicle. And I will tell you how, which, which tricks we use to do that, okay? So at the end, you have vesicle which carry adjuvant because they have this, uh, this uh, stimulatory component. And if you engineer the strain, they also carry the antigens that you're interested in. <coughs> so the, these vesicles are ready to go. You can just take them and use them as a vaccine. Isn't that beautiful? It's a fantastic idea because you can definitely go, you know, uh, do very simple, very cost-effective, you know, vaccine, for, theoretically for anything. Uh, um, and last but not least, um, as I said, or already introduced, the simplicity, because you just have to take uh, the bacterium, grow in the fermenter, in a flask, or whatever you want to use, take the supernatant, ultrafiltrate, we use trans tangential flow ultrafiltration, and you collect the vesicle, and you are ready to go. Nothing else. Nothing else to do. So very, very, very simple to produce. So as long as you have an overproducing a strain, a, a strain which a hypervesiculate, and I will tell you how we, do, we did that, well, you can really get a, a lot of vaccine doses you know, in, a, in one liter of your fermentation culture. You know? So that, that, that is a, So now you have two ways that you can use a, a, a vesicle as a vaccine. Uh, one way is to take the vesicle directly from the pathogens that, that releases the vesicle. If you have a pathogen which is a gram-negative bacterium, obviously this is a, this is a, is a, is a, is a prerequisite, you know, there must be a gram-negative bacterium. If a gram-negative bacterium, you just grow the bacterium, collect the vesicle, and can use the vesicle. And this is beautiful because you have the adjuvant, as I told you, but you also have the antigens, which are membrane, membrane exposed, which are usually the good antigen for making the vaccine. And uh, you, I showed you here just one example, meningococcus B. When I joined Chiron, I was the head of the Department of Molecular Biology, and in my department, we uh, started working on the, on the meningococcus B vaccine, which is now is in the, also on the market. It's the, 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 the commercial name is Bexeo. I don't want to publicize, but it's the only. But anyway, and, uh, and basically, this vaccine is based on a few recombinant antigens, but you have to put the vesicle from the mesiria in order to have a very efficacious vaccine as it is. So this vaccine works so well, and I tell you, it works so well. My grandchild was just vaccinated, you know, a year ago, you know. It's a fantastic vaccine, I tell you. Uh, but this works because there are vesicles in there. Okay. Or, as I told you, you can take uh, uh, bacterium, for, we use E. coli, Escherichia coli, and then you can... Uh, 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 engineer the E. coli with uh, any antigen you want, and then you can uh, use uh, a big vaccine uh, using the E. coli as a platform, for instance, and, and uh, use this platform from any vaccine you, uh, you might be interested in. But infection disease and cancer, if you, if you want. <coughs> okay. okay, that's what we are doing. Now, uh, this is the beautiful story. Now you say, okay, everything is done. There's no one, why, why, what, 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 the, what the problem, what are you doing? Well, there are some issues that have to be solved, of course, as usual. And, um, and I just mentioned three of them. And uh, <clears throat> the one issue, uh, one issue is reactogenicity. Now, adjuvanticity, the, the other side of the coin of adjuvanticity is reactogenicity. The, the adjuvant is, is, is too potent you, you, it, 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 it can, can cause a reactogenic, uh, can, uh, react, can, go, can cause you know, reaction, uh, uh, which can be, uh, can be severe. If you take LPS, which is uh, the lipopolysaccharide, which decorates the outer membrane, and we inject, you inject the LP, 10, 100 microgram of LPS in a mouse, the mouse die is dead in one minute. Okay, so, uh, so you, uh, LPS is a fantastic adjuvant, for uh, uh, agonist, fantastic, 
uh, you know, but you need, you need to control you know, the, the, radio, the, 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 the uh, efficacy, the adventicity of this. So that is something that is one problem. So the, you need to work on the vesicle in such a way that you down-regulate. You know, you, you, there must be a adjuvant, a good adjuvant, but not too much. Okay, so that is the... The other one that you, I said that you can engineer, well, okay, you can engineer, but you have to find tricks you know, to do it properly in an efficient manner, okay? So that is something that has to be worked out. And finally, uh, uh, heterogeneity and, uh, and uh, a lot of consistency. When you, so remember, you know, when you produce, uh, the, the way we do, we produce vesicle from E. coli, obviously uh, this vesicle carry many many endogenous proteins which derive from the outer membrane for the plasma space. Now, these proteins, as a matter of fact, they are not, uh, and does not cause any, do not cause any dangerous, they are not detrimental, they, 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 they does not, uh, 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 from a safety standpoint, they, they do not cause any problem. The problem is that obviously there are many uh, anti-proteins and when you use to, uh, you when you want to immunize someone, obviously this protein uh, uh, dilutes the immune response, as you can imagine, because you have your antigen of interest in, in, immersed in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sea of other proteins, okay, and therefore you dilute the immune response. So you, you theoretically you would like to eliminate as many endogenous proteins as possible in order to focus the immune response toward your antigen of interest, okay? And this is, by the way, I show you why we, are, we use CRISPR-Cas technology to eliminate this problem. So in, my, in the last four or five years, that's what we did. We focus on this, this aspect, and I will guide you through uh, uh, what we did, okay? Uh, can you please tell me how much, I don't know how much time? Oh, one hour, okay. So if I go too long, because when I start talking, I am very dangerous. So let me, let, let, let me, let me, let me just tell you let me just tell you how, with a simple slide, how we engineer. It's, it's very simple. We have different ways now we can do it. And basically, <clears throat> which are very simple, it's not, it's not, it's not high science, you know, Scott. But uh, usually you can, uh, you can hook your protein of interest uh, 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 um, next to a leader seeker for secretion, you know, usually the, the sec B, uh, the sec B pathway is, uh, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the pathway that we, you can definitely use. And as you know, if you hook this, this uh, the leader sequence, the proteins, you know, uh, can eventually go to the periplasmic space. Okay, they cross the inner membrane and it's releasing the periplasm. So if you simply try to look that, hook this leader sequence to the protein of interest, you have the protein in the periplasm. Okay, and if you have the protein in the periplasm, as I told you, the vesicle, when they're budding out, they trapped what is in the periplasm, and therefore you can decorate the protein in the lumen, inside, inside the cell. Inside the, inside the. And I will show you that, is, that, that that's can be useful. The other thing that we, uh, we found, and that in fact I, I anticipate this is the, the, my preferred way to deliver protein to the, to the outer membrane, is again to hook the protein to a leader sequence. But then you use the leader sequence, the lipoprotein leader sequence. I don't know how familiar you are with the, the, transport, the transport system of lipoprotein in, in, in the bacteria, in particular in negative bacteria, but the, it suffice to say that uh, the, the property of the lipoprotein leader sequence is such that the, the last amino acid of the, of, the, of the leader sequence, or if you want, the first amino acid of the protein is a cysteine, okay? It's a, it must be a cysteine. If you don't have a cysteine, you don't have a lipidation. And so if you take this leader sequence with the cysteine at the end, what happens is that the protein translocates through the inner membrane, and the thyroid group of the cysteine get deacylated, and once it's deacylated, the lipopeptidase cleaved the protein and released the amino terminus of the protein. And then at this point, there is a third acylation taking place on the, on the NH2, on the amino terminus of the protein. So now we have a three acylated lipoprotein. <coughs> Excuse me. And this three acylated protein then migrate to the outer membrane through a transport machine a specific transport machinery, okay, here. And then the, the, three, the, lipid, the lipid moiety, the three uh, fatty acids basically integrate in the inner lifted of the, of the outer membrane. And so basically now the lipoprotein are hooked into the outer membrane. 
So again, so if you think about you know, how the vesicles are, the outer membrane, and now you have basically the protein which is hooked in the, in the, outer, in the, in the outer membrane. Now, as I'll show you in a minute, you know, um, as I'll show you in a minute, the interesting thing that we found and that uh, even though theoretically the lipoprotein should be in, attached to the inner membrane but facing the lumen of the, outer, of the OMBs, uh, in fact, in many in circumstances, you know, this is not the case. And the protein is, uh, for somehow, is flipping out and is exposed on the surface. And this is a beautiful, you know, unit that, that is particularly interesting for our application. But let me just say that what, this is a few examples when uh, we decorate the protein in the lumen with the little sequence to see that we can, de these are the recombinant protein. And the, and the interesting thing that we found that if you immunize mice with this vesicle carrying the protein in the lumen, you still have a fantastic immune response. This is a 10 microgram of recombinant, purified recombinant protein in, 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 uh, with an adjuvant. And this is the title that you can get. When you have the protein the, the, in, in, the, in the lumen of the outer membrane and you immunize mice with the, with the, with the OMBs, you still have a very, very good saturating anti response, you know, despite the fact that they are inside. So the fact that it's in the lumen does not prevent uh, your vaccine from eliciting uh, uh, the immune response. However, when we do that with, uh, with uh, the lipoprotein leader sequence, you see this is a comparison. These are these protein, the five, these are the five proteins from Staphylococcus uh, uh, from Staphylococcus antigen, uh, Staphylococcus back, uh, uh, pathogen. We select five protein and we express in the lumen and you see there the expression here. When you hook to the leader sequence for, uh, for uh, li lipidation, lipid, uh, lipoprotein leader sequence, you see that the protein are, uh, are also expressed in the lumen, actually in the, in, the, in the vesicle, but usually they are better expressed. The expression is much is higher. And you can get an expression which can be as high as uh, 30 to 40 percent of the total uh, uh, OMB protein are represented by your antigens. Okay. And we can also now, we can also do in the same vesicle, we can also add more than one protein. So we, we now are able to decorate the vesicle with four proteins simultaneously. So you have one vesicle for a combinant antigen, if you want. Now, the, the interesting thing when you immunize with this uh, uh, protein, vesicle carrying the lipoprotein, you can get the saturating immune response. These are tight antibody titers with uh, as little as 2.21 microgram of OMBs, total protein. So you really need a tiny amount of, of uh, OMBs to get the saturating immune response. This in terms of antibody response. Uh, just, uh, just a question, just a point about you know, the expo exposition. So uh, this is uh, the detail on how you know, the lipoprotein are transported to the, to the outer membrane, as I told you. Now, in, in, in a number of bacteria, it's been described that there are systems which allow the flipping out of the protein. But this is a, these are active, is a active process, okay? And uh, there are, and this, they have been described a number of these, of these processes that allow the lipoprotein to be exposed on the surface. Now, what we found, and this is, was a completely serendipity, actually, uh, what we found is that when we do that exercise with several proteins, you know, and then we look at it the, the local, local, by, by, we, by simply hooking this leader sequence, we found that the protein, in fact, are localized on the surface, completely, very well exposed. And this is true for um, bacteria, the whole cell, but it's also true for vesicles. This is the gold, I don't know if you can see from the back, but this is the gold, uh, 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 immunogold staining in which uh, uh, you see that the antigens, which is expressed on the vesicle, basically it really localized on the, on the outside of the, of the, of the outer member vesicle. And this is, is really interesting. Now, uh, so that is the way we engineer. Now, let's go to the point, you know, how we try to, to avoid the dilution of the immune system. And then we, uh, have, we go to the CRISPR-Cas you know, method, you know. Uh, so um, uh, let me say, let me start by saying that, okay, the, the concept here is to, okay, we want to eliminate as many proteins as possible from, uh, from, uh, from the vesicles. So how to do that? Obviously, we look at, uh, we, by using proteomic analysis, we characterize the, the proteins that are present in, uh, in the vesicle. We also did bioinformatic analysis to predict which protein could be expressed. And uh, at the end of the day, we decided here to, we started to focus on, uh, as a first approach, 
91 uh, proteins, which are m the most abundant, ex uh, you know, particularly ab abundantly expressed in the outer membrane. So we decided to start with that. We also n knew that these 90, 91 proteins were dispensable. And that's, we knew that on the basis of, uh, of the, what is, I don't know how familiar you are with this library, which is called KO Library, which are the, the, the groups in Japan. They systematically inactivate each gene in E. coli in a systematic manner, not, not a cumulative, one, one, uh, one, uh, only one, 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 one strain, one, muta one, one mutation. And they're asking the question of which genes are dispensable, which genes are indispensable. And so basically now they have the long list of, pro of genes that are considered to be dispensable or considered to be indispensable. Now, these 91 proteins that we have selected, okay, fall obviously in the category, in the category of, uh, non -dis uh, of uh, 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 dispensable proteins. So, not, uh, so they, 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 if you knock them out as a single gene, they, 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 the mutant is viral. We knew that, okay. Now, so that is it. So the idea was to try to accumulate all 91 mutations in one strain. Now, E. coli is the most, you know, the most studied organism in the world. And the method for knocking out genes have been described, you know, I don't know how many years ago. But as a matter of fact, if you follow what the procedure that uh, is, uh, is, was currently published, you know, usually takes uh, about uh, a month, between, uh, let's say, three weeks and a month, to do the knockout, because you have to, you know, the, 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 the engineer, the method, and you have to usually, so I don't want to bother you with it's done, but trust me, you know, if you want knockout, you know, a gene in, using the traditional manner takes about three weeks a month. Okay, which obviously, if you want to knock out 100 genes, the math is very simple, 100 per, per, per month, so 100 months. 100 months are how many? 10 years, okay? It's too much for me, I am too old, you know, to wait for, for, the, for, for the, the result. So we need to develop a method which were, uh, were obviously more efficient than the net, okay? And uh, again, I just would like to, uh, if, for those of you which might be interested, you can look at this publication. We just published this a couple of years ago. And uh, I, I, I tell you, uh, I just, uh, just would like you to uh, please trust me, we can produce uh, a, a, a mutant, uh, uh, can get selected, get, get the, muta the mutant, the strain, the mutant strain every two days. So every two days we can make a mutant. Uh, we screen only 10 colonies after transformation, and usually the efficiency is uh, between the 50 to 100 percent. So usually we screen, we take, uh, no, we make a transformation, we, uh, uh, we tele take 10 colonies, we analyze 10 colonies, and if the, the, there is no uh, the mutation that we want, that means that the mutation is little, is not viable, That's it. because otherwise we get it, okay? So again, I don't, I, 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 if you want, I can give you all the details of the procedure, but I don't want to bother you again with the CRISPR cas you know, because I'm, you know more than me well, how, how it works. Potentially, the, essentially, this is the, the method that we use. And by doing so, we managed to uh, do all the, in, in a year, in approximately a year, and Ilaria was the lady that really did most of the job, in approximately a year, so uh, we fa finish, you know, this uh, these, uh, these, uh, attempt to accumulate 91 mutation in a single strain, okay, in a single or thing. And uh, obviously what we found is that uh, 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 some of these uh, mutations were not compatible with the other mutations. So, uh, so in, at the end of the day, out of the 91 genes that we tested, uh, you know, to, be, uh, to, to have a cumul accumulate, accumulate, cumulative mutants, only uh, about 70, 60, 65, 70 percent were successful. So at the end, we have a strain that is uh, delta 60. So there are 60 genes which has been deleted in the same in the same strain. Again, these are these are genes that encode proteins which are localized in the outer membrane. Okay, we do, we were focused only on that. We were interested only on those particular proteins. And. Uh, uh, when we, just to tell you a little bit about the te te technicalities, you know, when we did a mutation, we, uh, uh, we decided to, we, we, the, the go-no-go criteria to move forward was obviously viability, 
and the second one was uh, growth. So that, uh, the, the, is the growth in pair or is the delay? And so we, the, we, we, want, we wanted to, to select only mutants that uh, had a, a very a good uh, wild-type growth capacity, something like that. And third, vesiculation. We were interested to make sure, so we, did, we didn't move forward next to the next mutation if we, uh, obviously, if the mu mutation would have impaired uh, the, the, the vesiculation capacity of the frog. And this is the indication of the vesiculation capacity. And interestingly enough, you know, when we start accumulating mutation, actually the, the strain became, become, uh, become, the strains become more uh, vesiculating, okay? And look at the end, of the, the end of the story. So on the last mutant that we have, the, the one which accumulates 60 mutation, we have uh, is incredibly a vesiculation capacity. In a one liter fermenter, we can produce more than 100 milligram of vesicle a liter, which is a lot. If you think that the dose of vaccine, one microgram is sufficient uh, to make a two for a single dose, one microgram, uh, so is a million, a million, is that a hundred milligram, and a hundred milligram? I don't know, you just make them up, but you know, it's a lot. They not, they tend to defeat uh, under thousand uh, lots, uh, vaccine lots in, a sing in one liter culture. Obviously we sequence the, 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 the genome of the, of the final, uh, we, we test everything, uh, so, and uh, we also look at the, the, the 2D gel analysis. You can see that this is the original strain and this uh, the, the Delta 60 strain, you can appreciate by eye you know, that uh, in fact there is a substantial reduction of the, of the proteins which are in the 2D map. And you desire some detail, you see here that was the plan B protein was deleted, the SKB protein deleted, and the ART J that are, they disappear. So we basically confirm that the mutation, in fact, uh, not only removed the gene, but also uh, uh, removed the protein. Uh, uh, just one point about uh, science again, that uh, I told you that some mutations were not feasible, okay? And, and, uh, and this is a very interesting from a, from a biological standpoint, so why, did, why it's so, okay? And uh, I think that by this exercise allows us to understand a little bit more about the function of the proteins. Uh, because well, if you use this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, beautiful uh, 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 database, which is called String. I don't, maybe you are familiar. If you are not, please go and visit the String. It's a beautiful database. And uh, basically, what we did here, actually, I did. It took. Uh, a, 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 I, I just put uh, you know the the mutant that uh, were successful, and then uh, uh, we uh, I, this protein is uh, could not be accumulated. <coughs> on top of that. And this is database is beautiful because basically uh, it tells you, you know, which are the possible links between each protein. A link, when I say links, can be uh, association in the genome, can be uh, information about protein-protein interaction, can be association about function. Okay, so you can, this is a beautiful database. It's the most, the most, I mean, the most fantastic database I've ever seen. Now, this protein, any gene that we start with a the Y, okay, means that it's hypothetical. So when we, uh, in, in fact, you know, 30% of the protein that we use were hypothetical, were not known, that we try to knock out. And so the question is, which is the function of that? You know, when you use this string, you see that these protein are strongly associated with these other protein <coughs> that we inactivated in, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, simultaneously. And, uh, and uh, you know the, the interesting thing that all these proteins are involved in, in, in iron transport, in iron transport. So that means that, uh, or actually it's, most li it's very likely that our protein of unknown function probably is also involved in iron transportation somehow. And uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you have uh, this mutation or in, on top of other three mutations which also impair iron transportation, Basically, uh, this, this mutation becomes, becomes uh, 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 non viable because, at the end, you starve, literally starve the bacterium you know, uh, uh, from iron because you know, also the absence of other transport, uh, transport genes are there. So, you basically, you can get a lot of information on the biology of the, of the, of the, of the, of the strain and on the function of the genes and on the protein. 
reactogenicity is to just briefly uh, tell you, you know, again, I told you that, uh, that um, uh, you need to control reactogen reactogenicity. And, uh, and, we, and we found that our mutant, in fact, reduces the reactogenicity uh, substantially. And you, can, you have different assays that you can follow reactogenicity. One of the assays, we follow the agonistic activity on TOLA4. This is LPS, which mostly you know, uh, activate TOLA4. But in general, you could, we use a macrophage. This is a human cell line that is differentiated to macrophages. And you look at this, the, the, you incubate this, uh, this cell line with the vesicle, and you look at the production of, of IL-6 as uh, an indication of the of, uh, of the inflammatory uh, effect. And this is the typical assay that we used when I was in Novartis for, for the Bexero, the vaccine which is in the market, and also for other vaccines for Shigella, for instance. Now, our, our OMVs, you know, is, as you see, substantially reduce uh, the uh, activation, the, uh, the reactogenicity of these as, as, uh, as measured by TOLA4 and the IF6 production. And the, and the, and the uh, and the level of uh, reduction is uh, absolutely compatible with what is already in the humans in the clinic. So we believe that our uh, formula, our vaccine, our vesicle are very well acceptable uh, for, for, for uh, human application. Uh, I don't want to bother you too much on that because I want to go to the, to the cancer story for, for in, in the last 10 minutes. Uh, uh, le, le, now, okay, you now I show you, I hope that I have kind of convinced you that, that uh, we can engineer the vesicle. We have, we have a strain that, uh, that is now is, uh, uh, is uh, particularly, particularly indicated for vaccine application because we have eliminated several you know, endogenous protein and by doing so we, also, we have also reduced the reactogenicity. Of, of the vesicle to a level that is definitely compatible with human use for pediatric use. I mean pediatric, which is different for the. For the. Now the question is okay, but uh, do, do this vesicle work? So can we really make a vaccine? So I will, I will give you the example of uh, of uh, two examples very very rapidly of a bacterial uh, bacterial vaccine. We have engineered the vesicle with antigens from Streptococcus A, group A Streptococcus, the, 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 the pathogen that causes you know, pharyngitis and uh, most, uh, the most severe disease, which is a uh, rheumatic heart disease. And we decorate the vesicle and we test the vesicle engineer with this uh, in animal models, in which you challenge the animal and you, and you look at the survival, you immunize animal, challenge the animal with a, with a, patho with a human uh, isolate or, or group A streptococcus, and then you look at for survival as, in essence. And as you can see here, you know, by engineering the vesicle, uh, we have a basically 100% survival of our mice. And now we have a vaccine which is constituted by three antigens from the group A streptococcus, and, uh, and this uh, vaccine is moving to the clinic, okay? And this is something that we recently published, uh, and, uh, and this is just a group uh, staph Staphorius, Staphorius, and we again selected five antigens, five antigens, and we decorate the vesicle with the five antigens, and then we test uh, the antigens in a, in a three different mouse model, which are the, the typical mouse models which are used for Staphylococcus aureus. But if we look again at the, the, the most uh, easy to understand one, which is uh, the, the lethal model, you again do exactly the same as, as group A. You immunize animal, then you 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 you, uh, cha you challenge the uh, the animal with uh, the uh, human isolate, which is uh, Staphylococcus, and look for survival. And again, as you can see, when you put a combination of the five of the of the five antigens with the Staphylococcus, you know you get basically a complete protection. And this is true for the sepsis model. It's also true for the renal abscess model and for the skin infection model. So we do believe that uh, uh, this uh, uh, vesicle can really uh, um, uh, be uh, tested and should, should really move to the clinic. But uh, I am becoming more and more interested in, uh, in the in cancer immunology story now. And, uh, and let me just uh, probably uh, tell you, um, I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, with the cancer, with the cancer, cancer vaccine, 
but uh, you probably know that cancer vaccine in the past has been, uh, been attempted several times. So the idea is to vaccinate patients uh, you know, with, uh, uh, with cancer antigens, with cancer tumor-associated antigens, uh, or possibly tumor-specific antigen, and, uh, and, and see whether this vaccination can eventually cure the patient from, uh, from, uh, from the disease. So this is in, differently from uh, the vaccines that I showed you before for, for, for infection diseases. These are not prophylactic vaccines, but are therapeutic vaccines. So the idea is to vaccinate to cure the disease, not to prevent the disease. Okay, and uh, to make a long story short, you know, in general, you know, the, um, there are an, an interesting paper that has been published analyzing the result, the overall result of cancer vaccine, and that were really disappointed. You know, they, they, they basically didn't work. Now, the, the interest in cancer vaccine has been basically rejuvenated. Uh, um, with the discovery that, um, uh, that uh, obviously in the cancer uh, uh, um, carry, uh, the, the, the genome of a cancer cell carry very several mutations, okay? And that has been now, uh, and, and that has been recently discovered that this mutation can create uh, uh, new epitopes, epitopes which are basically T cell or also B cell epitopes, which these epitopes are really tumor specific because they are. They, they are generated because of the mutation, mutation that do not exist in normal, in, in, in normal cells. So, so the idea has been, okay, why? Okay, if we focus, on, we use this neo-epitope as, uh, as a vaccine, as an antigen, you know, for stimulating the immune response, we might be more successful to try to use, you know, the whole protein or tumor-associating antigen. And therefore, the, the process that is used is you basically take uh, the biopsy from, or from the tumor, you sequence the genome, you analyze the genome, and you uh, compare the genome from the tumor with the genome from, uh, from the, the healthy tissue of the same patient, and you compare the two genomes, and you look for the, and you analyze the mutation, you look for the mutation. And the, if you find a mutation, then you use uh, an, uh, the bioinformatic tools now to predict whether or not this mutation can elicit uh, a, a T cell responses, is a, is a T cell antigen or not. And if this is the case, a vaccine is constantly created using these, um, these uh, mutations and uh, is, uh, is uh, used to immunize uh, the patient. So now the secret to, uh, to complete the cycle obviously is time. Uh, the, the, the key point is time. You have to do it in a question of a couple of months, no more than that, because obviously you have to, you have to otherwise you lose the patient before you, you prepare the vaccine. So sequencing the genome now is a question of one day or two days. Doing the bioinformatic analysis is also pretty rapid. So you have to find a way to now, once you have the epitopes, you know, to make a vaccine in order to be used. And in this paper that uh, came out, you know, a year or two years ago in Nature, they show uh, two examples of how you can make this vaccine. One is used using synthetic peptides and adjuvant, and another one is used by using RNA, synthetic RNA, to make, to make the other one. And these are promising. There is a third one that is out. So the, now uh, people is getting more and more interested in that. So we believe that uh, our vesicle could enter into this cycle, into this loop, because if once we have the information of the epitope, we can eventually engineer the vesicle with the epitope and use the vesicle to, uh, to, vaccinate, to vaccinate the patient. So that is uh, basically the idea. So we first test the we ask the question whether if we decorate the vesicle with, uh, uh, with epitopes, can we elicit uh, epitope-specific T-cell responses? That was uh, the first question. And we use the standard you know, uh, model uh, uh, epitope, which is the OVA epitope in, in C57 in mice. We engineer the epitope and we look for the elicitation of, uh, of uh, epitope of, of a specific T cell. And in fact, you see that we have a very nice you know, induction of, uh, of a specific T cell. <coughs> and as a control, this is with, uh, with a standard adjuvant, which is called poly C, is a hiltonol, which is the poly C uh, uh, um, uh, formulation, which is a tall three uh, uh, adjuvant. And uh, as you see, that the, the there is a, a substantial uh, a better performance uh, of, uh, of our vesicle with respect to, the, to this, uh, to this, uh, this argument, uh, at least under the, the, the condition that we use. Then we ask the question whether 
and we can uh, this response is sufficient to protect mice from uh, from uh, from uh, uh, the challenge with with cells so we challenge mice with 57 mice with a b16 b16 uh, uh, f10 cell line which is a typically syngenic uh, cell line and then we look at uh, uh, usually in, in, in three to four weeks you have the growth of uh, uh, of the tumor, of the tumor in the sub Q, and then you have to sacrifice mice. You know, after about a month from the from the challenge, so we challenge the mice, and then we immunize mice with our vesicle decorated with this uh, with this epitope, and in fact you you see with a single epitope you have a nice uh, a nice uh, uh, inhibition of tumor growth. Okay. We did that also with uh, a, a construct in which we have. Uh, uh, two epitopes, a B cell epitope and a, and a T cell epitope, and when we combine the two epitopes and we repeat the challenge, we do the challenge and we Im immunize the animal. Basically, we can get the complete uh, inhibition of the tumor of the tumor, you know, using this vesicle. Um, uh, the last thing that I would like to tell you uh, about is uh, <coughs> the, this, uh, I'm finished. I'm, I promise, I'm finished. Is the is the story of the of the of the microbiome and how the microbiome, you know, how, why we are interested in microbiome, and this is actually the uh, what I, I will be doing in the next five years with my second advance. Uh, so basically, uh, the, it has been now demonstrated that uh, that the microbiome influenced uh, the immunotherapy, immunocancer immunotherapy, and that has been shown. Uh, in the animal model, in the, in, the, in the animal models, as well as in you, in the in the, in, the, in, the, in the real life in humans, and uh, and uh, in, in other words, it has been shown that uh, if you treat a patient with uh, the checkpoint inhibitors, for instance, the PD1 or PDL1 uh, inhibitors, basically, as you know, uh, this uh, uh, this patient uh, unfortunately differentiate between responding, usually differentiate between responder and non-responder. Okay. And uh, what, uh, there are a number of studies, and I invite you to, to you know, uh, Zit Volkel is one of the ladies that did a lot of work on the, on the microbiome analysis. Uh, basically, when they look at the microbiome of the responders versus the non-responders, they, they basically can show, they, they show that they can stratify the patient on the basis of the composition of the microbiome. And uh, interestingly enough, actually, you can, you can go to, uh, they also show that you do fecal transplantation in mice. You take the fe fecal transplantation from, from responder and non-responder, and then you look at the, the, the capacity of mice, to you challenge mice with the tumor, uh, the, fe the, 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 the microbiome from responders protect mice from, uh, uh, from, uh, from, the, from the tumor challenge, while uh, uh, the, um, uh, the transplantation from no responders do not protect the mice. So they, they, this is an interesting and fascinating story. And now they are, they are accumulating more and more convincing evidence that in fact the microbiome governs, you know, the way how a, a person, a patient can respond to tumor and to, to tumor therapy. Now, the big question is why, why it's so, and that is, uh, is, is is a, is, a, is a very intense and important uh, uh, um, um, part of, of, of the research. But we also recently, uh, we recently asked the question whether the microbiome can influence the efficacy of, of cancer vaccine. That we also asked, because that was shown for checkpoint inhibitors. The question is, that do cancer vaccine also are, are influenced by, by the microbiome? And so we did a simple experiment. We, uh, that we in a challenge mice with a tumor. This is a, this is a, a bulb C, a CT26 model, a cell line model. And uh, we challenge mice with this tumor sub Q, and then we vaccinated mice with a vesicle decorated with five T cell epitopes. Actually, there are uh, four T cell epitopes, four CD4 T cell, and one CD8 T cell epitope. And, we va we va and so after challenge, we vaccinate with the vesicle. And on, in addition to that, to, to a group of mice, we also gave these mice gavages of uh, bifidobacterium. Bifidobacterium is the, is the bacterium you can go to the supermarket. You can go, you can buy to the, to the supermarket in the yogurt, you know, bifidobacterium is a typical, you know, probi probiotic uh, uh, component. 
So you basically, we basically fed mice uh, the three, two times actually with this bifidobacterium. And, and then we, and, and we look at the, the effect on vaccination. And uh, to make a long story short, here you see that the mice that uh, did not receive anything, uh, you know, obviously they developed a vaccine tumor. Uh, the, one, the mice that were vaccinated, they, they, they actually were a reduction in tumor growth. And when you do both the vaccination and, and, um, and gavages, you know, you have a, even a better effect. And when we sequence the entire genome and the microbiome, you know, on these, uh, on these mice, you see that you can stratify very nicely the responder, the better responder best to the, 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 the no responder. Not only that, but we found that there are a couple of uh, species that become one species, which is, uh, which is the Bacteroides uh, uh, S247, for those of you who might be interested, that basically are, uh, 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 become more abundant in the, in, the, in the microbiome of these mice, of the protected mice, and, and another one, you know, in Lactospiace, which uh, is becoming less abundant. So basically, the gavage uh, with bifidobacterium, uh, bifidobacterium in this particular case do, uh, uh, does not, uh, they do not, because there are four species, do not colonize the, the gut of the mice, but alter the composition of the microbiome in such a way that you have some species that become more abundant and other less abundant. And these species apparently uh, 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 result in the, 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 in the, in the in a, in, a, in, a, in a different effect of, of the vaccination. So now, what is we obviously we are uh, doing now is try to understand why. It's so, which is the mechanism which basically uh, is uh, is under this uh, this interesting and fascinating aspect of uh, of uh, uh, of the microbiome and, and cancer immunotherapy. We do have an hypothesis. Uh, the hypothesis is that uh, that we had, there is a kind of mim molecular mimicry in the T cells. So there are, uh, um, uh, we believe, uh, and there are uh, actually evidence, there is evidence for that, that the microbiome can elicit T cell, which basically prime the response for the, for the, for the tumor. And this is something that we are investigating very, very intensively. I just would like to say that there is a beautiful uh, case that I just, just of a molecular mimicry in real life in humans. You probably might know that the pancreatic cancer is probably one of the most deadly cancers that uh, is uh, that, uh, for, for human. About 98% you know, die you know, within like, uh, two years, three years you know, after treatment. But there are uh, uh, long-term survivors. And there are people, 2%, actually less than 2% of the people that survive. And now the, the people, they are, uh, they are following up and this, there are these people that are now uh, uh, still alive after 12 years from, from the, diagnos the, 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 the diagnosis of the, of the pancreatic cancer. And so there is this uh, lucky short, small population of people that have a real a long survivor. And what has been found, this is a beautiful paper that they invite you, it's very interesting to look at in nature. And they ask, they ask the question, they try to investigate what's going on, why they are this long survivor. And they found that these people have, uh, are enriched in a particular uh, T cell clone, you know, which they characterize the sequence. And they found that this, cell called, this, this T cell recognize a specific epitope from, from a human pathogen. Okay, so the only the presence of this T cell, of this specific T cell, which cross react with the T cell induced by a human pathogen, basically is key for guaranteed long-term survival. Because basically all these people that have this long-term survival have this cross-reactive T cell. And this goes to the point to the point that probably cross-reactivity is really, uh, I'm not saying this is the only mechanism that uh, really uh, it govern you know, the interplay between vaccination and immunotherapy and microbiome, but surely, surely is important. So we believe that uh, the, the proper selection of microbiome can eventually elicit a specific cell in which when the cancer is mutated and there is, you have a generation of new epi, if there is a T cell which has really, is already been primed you know, by the microbiome, then you can have the response to the tumor. That is our hypothesis and we are now spending our uh, time you know, to try to demonstrate that and to see whether this is true or not. 
but there are precedents you know, for, for this. Okay, so that is uh, the end of the story. Thank you so much for your very kind attention and sorry for being here.